we ended with the emission line spectrum, right, or what is known as an atomic line spectrum or an emission line spectrum. And so, again, what we did is we took a tube, we pulled all of the atoms out of it, and we put selectively certain atoms back in. Right? And in particular, we tried to keep those pure, so we'd put in just hydrogen, or we'd put in just neon, or just argon. We'd pick certain gases to put back in. And then we pumped 20,000 volts through it. Okay? When those 20,000 volts pass through the individual atoms, we see a glow. Okay? Said another way, we have neon lights. Right? This is what we're doing when we have neon lights. So this exact process. If we put that light emission up to a prism and split it into the constituent pieces, this is where our observation kind of comes into play and we actually learn something about atomic structure. Right? If we've got purple light, when we split this out into the prism, what we might have expected to see would have been a whole bunch of purple light coming out, right? This nice continuous band of just purple light. We didn't. What we saw instead was these very thin, refined bands of color, okay? So in this case, when we looked at hydrogen, we saw red, blue, green, and violet. And if your eyes are really good, sometimes you can pick up a fourth violet. I think it's for hydrogen. Right, but that's right at the edge of our ability to see. So what does this mean? Okay, we have this theory that it should be this big continuous purple thing, and instead we see these weird lines. Okay, well, what are those lines due to? Okay, at this point, we're pumping electric current in. We know those are electrons. So we could hypothesize that this is due something to the electrons. Well, at this stage in the game, where do our electrons exist? This is an atom, and that's a nucleus. Where are my electrons? Outside, right? I could have an electron here. I can have an electron over here. I could have one here. That's what's supposed to be an E. Right? The electrons could exist anywhere. Right? And if we consider what's happening, we're pumping a bunch of energy into this. So that energy is going in, and it's going to cause these electrons to move. Okay, so like if we put 20,000 volts under one of your seats and we've triggered that, we'd know very quickly that you just got hit with 20,000 volts, right? Because you would probably jump up. The electrons are doing the same thing. Eventually, what would you do? Die. I'm not still pumping 20... Just one of the little buzzers, man. Just not make it 20,000 volts. What's that? You'd be all right. You just stand for the rest of the lecture, assuming you didn't walk out. Yeah, you would just stand there? No, you'd be walking around. You might be walking around. Eventually, you'll be like, okay, that's cool. That's funny. And you might move to a different chair, right? Okay. Because are any of you standing right now? No. So eventually, what would you do? If you stayed in the class you'd sit back down. Electrons are going to do the same thing. Right? So if I pumped, whoops, shouldn't have erased that one, 20,000 volts into that electron, it's going to go to a higher energy. Because right? I said the electrons could exist anywhere, it's going to move up to a higher energy. Why would it be higher energy red versus blue? And don't be doing some color stuff, because I didn't think of that. Why is the red one right now a higher energy than the blue one? It has to do with distance from the nucleus. What charge is the nucleus? Positive. If you're closer to the nucleus as an electron, what happened to your charge? It becomes more neutral. The further from the nucleus, more charge. So higher in energy. Charge is dangerous. Okay? So the red one is higher in energy. The only reason it jumped up there was because we pumped 20,000 volts in. Eventually, you get over your anger with me pumping 20,000 volts into your seat and you sit back down, okay? That energy had to be dissipated somewhere, okay? It had to go somewhere. In the case of you, okay, it could be in the laughter. It could be screaming really loud. It could have been walking out of the classroom. Eventually, you walk back in and sit back down, right? Okay? That energy gets dissipated. 
the electron here is going to do the same thing. When it comes back down, that energy has to be released somehow. It doesn't just disappear. If that transition is perfect, that energy that's released happens to match the visible light range. So what we end up seeing is some visible light when it relaxes back down. That's it. Simple as that. Right? If our theory about this was that the electrons could exist anywhere, they could be jumping from anywhere to anywhere, which means how many different energies are possible for those jumps? An infinite amount. So if we look at the color emission out of that, what would we expect to see? All colors in a particular purple range. That would make sense. But we don't see that. We see these stupid bands. What does that mean? Can the electrons exist anywhere? No. no. I'm only seeing particular jumps which means the electrons have to exist at particular locations. Not only do they have to exist at particular locations, they can't jump to anywhere. Because if they could jump to anywhere, I'm going to get that infinite number of possibilities. They can only make jumps to certain locations. Okay. That certain location is reflected in the color bands that we see for our emission line spectrum. What does that mean about our atomic model? That means electrons don't exist everywhere. They exist at discrete locations, at discrete energies. Okay? It was Bohr that put this model forward okay? and said, this is where the electrons exist. They exist at these discrete energy levels. He referenced them as orbits. Why might he reference them as orbits? They go around the nucleus, kind of like how... The planets go around the sun. So it matches our current model or our understanding of it. As we dig deeper, we find the orbit model is horrible and horrendous and you should never use it because they aren't orbits. When we think about the orbit model, you think, tend to think, well, if I put an electron here, where can it go? Well, it can go around this. No. Okay. And it can exist in a lot of different locations. That's why the orbit model is bad. Okay. But what it does give us is this idea of energy levels. Okay, so what we can do is simplify our diagram, and instead of looking at it as orbits that are circular, we could look at it as this kind of vertical jump upward away from the nucleus. Kind of, sort of? So let's drop an electron in there. The first electron I'd expect to go there. Why would I put it there? closest to the nucleus, that's the most stable. That's where I'm going to start my electron. What happens when I pump 20,000 volts into it? It jumps. So there's my 20,000 volts. Okay, and it jumps upwards. Now what happens? Do you get visible light? Just a second. Uh, actually, I'm going to answer your question first. Okay. Do you get visible light yet? What's happened so far? Oh, it's absorbed the energy. I've only put energy into this. Okay? Visible light means something had to come out so that I could see it. We don't want to stick our face in 20,000 volts. Okay? So at this point, all that's happened is we've pumped tons of energy into this. I don't see anything. Okay? But what will happen is that electron is going to jump back down eventually. When it jumps back down, the transition between that orbit call it our purple orbit and our red orbit, that is a difference in energy. That difference in energy corresponds to part of the electromagnetic spectrum. If it happens to match the visible light spectrum, I now see a color. Neat. At least I think it's neat. How are we doing with that? Straightforward so far? So let's see how badly we can break this. So here's an electron. Where could that electron jump to? 
It could jump to orbit two. Now where could it jump? Or where else could it have jumped? It could have jumped to orbit three. 20,000 volts is a lot of freaking energy. Okay? It could jump to two. It could jump to three. Okay? What happens when it jumps to two? Eventually it comes back down. I'm going to be very subtle about this. Subtle was not the greatest word, but we're going to do it anyway. It jumps back down, and it releases some form of energy. Let's call that energy one. What happens with the blue one? Okay. Interesting one with the, the second one. It could jump down to the second one. Should have thought of that. Damn it. If you're really good with colors, you may be picking up what I'm doing. Okay. That blue one could have jumped to the second one, which would have released what? Energy, right? Would it be the same as energy one? No. Why not? Smaller distance, right? Look at our picture. What about the blue one? If it jumped from three to one, could it do that? Yeah. It can jump anywhere on those steps, but that's it. So we could get energy three, right? What's the deal with the color coding? The greater the jump, the greater the energy is released. The greater the jump, the greater the energy released, which would correspond to which color? <coughs> violet or red? Violet. A violet. So our blue jump is the largest jump here, corresponding to a blue color. The red one is the smallest jump, so we're getting a red color, a smaller energy. The orange one is a jump that's somewhere in between those two, so we get a color that matches somewhere in between. Kind of, sort of? Okay. So the colors that we are seeing when we look at the emission band have to do with electrons making those transitions. Okay. Which specific transitions? Because there are more orbits. We could go further and further away. Okay. What color would you expect for the transition from out here, where we got that else, all the way down to here? Okay. So we heard two things. More purple than red. Good. Is that violet or ultraviolet? Uh, it's kind of vague. We didn't quantify anything, but take a guess. Tried to make that as big a jump as I could make, so let's call it ultraviolet. Do I see that? No. No. Does it still happen? Yes. Yes. Okay. So when we're talking about the emission spectrum, it's just what we see. There are certain jumps and transitions that we are allowed to see, okay, due to what our eyes acknowledge. There are other jumps that still happen, but we can't see them. Okay. What this puts together is that we get these energy levels, and this explains the structure behind where our electrons exist. Okay? Or rather, it starts to explain it. Okay? Bohr gets credit for this, so his name is important. What he's addressing here is what's known as the quantum concept. Okay? Quantum chemistry is kind of neat, which you've probably seen in all the videos or all the movies. When they can't explain why something happens, what do they say? Quantum. Because it works really well. No one's smart enough to be able to say, yeah, that's BS. They just be like, ah, you know, maybe. Okay? So that's what happens with our quantum. That's kind of the level we work at okay, in this class. It just does. Okay? What the quantum concept is actually referring to is this en discrete energy level. So discrete is referring to distinct energy levels. So if we could look at these two comparisons, we've got a ramp and stairs. Stairs are discrete. Okay? They are quantized. There's distinct energy levels at which you can exist. Okay? If you tried walking up the stairs or down the stairs in here, can you take a half a step? That sound is me attempting to take half a step and then not following through on it. Because if I take half a step, what happens? I'm not on a step, and if I try to shift and put my weight, I'm going to fall on my face. Okay, could I take a step and a half? I, 
A lot of you are staring at me waiting for me to fall. That's a little sketchy. <laughs> okay? Again, it's going to be an issue. I can't exist at that state. I have to exist at the individual step. Whereas on a ramp, could I take a step and a half? Yeah, because the ramp is a continuous slope that allows me to exist at any one of those levels. Stairs, I can only exist at the stair. Does that mean I can't have to go through each step? Right? No, I could jump all the way down, which is a horribly big jump right here. Right? I can do any one of those jumps. I just have to have the energy that allows me to make that jump. Make sense? Hi. So a rainbow. What do you think a rainbow is? Quantized, continuous. Okay. Rainbow's a fun one. What are the colors in the rainbow? Roy G. Biv. So there's not red-orange. Red-orange is a color does not exist in the rainbow. There's red and orange, but there's not red-orange. Okay. We as humans have said there's distinct things, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, because saying there's red, red-orange, red-orange, orange, orange is tedious. Thank you. Okay. All of those colors exist there. Okay. That's a continuous system. We have overlain a false stair step. Why? Because it makes it easier for us to explain and label. Right? But a rainbow is continuous. How about an atomic line spectrum? Let's see if we can get a picture. How about an atomic line spectrum? Are those continuous? I see all the colors here. What am I seeing? Specific, Specific, distinct lines. Atomic line spectrum are discrete or quantized. It is that difference between the continuous spectrum of a rainbow and our atomic line spectrum that gives us atomic theory, okay, or electron orbitals. Okay? So we've got our colors in here. This is a specific example. So when we're looking at hydrogen, what we're referencing to see those colors is an electron jumping, or rather falling, from the fifth energy level to the second. You notice it's not going to the first. Why not? Does the first, fifth to first still happen? Yes. What color would it be? Ultraviolet. It's a larger jump than five to one. It's ultraviolet. It's outside the visible range. I can't see it. Okay? It's still there. But it just so happens that the matching for our visible range is 5 to 2. Okay. What color would I expect of that? Why do we care about the color? What does the color tell us? Represents energy. Represents energy. Okay. So that purple color is an energy. That's a larger jump. That's why it's purple. Because purple is a higher energy than red. Remember last lecture, I was like, all I really want is what are the colors? Which one's high and low energy? This is why. Okay. What happens when I look at the four to two? Is that a bigger jump or a smaller jump? Smaller jump, which means the color should become higher energy, lower energy? Lower energy. What's a lower energy than purple? All of them, really. Okay. In this case, it's blue-green. Okay? The specifics of what that color is, I don't need you to know. What I need you to know is their relationships. Okay? Last one, three to two. Smallest. smallest jump, smallest energy, which is red. Kind of, sort of? Okay. Our electrons will exist in these orbits. Every atom has those same orbits. Which would kind of mean that as we move through the periodic table, shouldn't we be able to see the exact same color jumps? Right? That's a natural conclusion. Well, you tell me. Helium, are there only four colors? No. In fact, I get uh, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight bands. Why different?
We did talk about the levels, so the energy differences between those orbitals. But I said all of those orbits exist for every single atom. Why would we see different jumps? The electrons change. What happens when I bring an electron near an electron? They repel. Am I changing the energy? Yeah. A single electron by itself has a different energy than an electron paired with another one. There's a repulsive force there. That energy has changed. Because the energy has changed, what happens to the orbit? The orbit changes. While I may still have the orbit, the energy, the exact energy of that orbit also changes, which means my line spectrum changes. What else changes as we go through our periodic table? Not just the number of electrons, but the number of protons. As my nucleus gets more positive charge, what happens to the attractive force between the nucleus and our electrons? It becomes stronger, which means the energy of the orbits changes again. So every time we change the atom, we change the energy of our orbits, which means the orbitals also change, which means the atomic line spectrum also change, which means I can go through and look at the atomic line spectrum for an individual element, and it will be different than every other element. What I have created is what? Right up at the top, an atomic fingerprint. I can look at the emission spectrum and I can determine what the element is. That's kind of neat. Okay. Why is that extra neat? I can aim a telescope at another planet. I can look at the light coming back and I can segregate that light out into atomic line spectrum to identify what elements are present at that planet. What the F? <laughs> that is cool. Vastly oversimplified. Okay but it's close enough, okay? That's kind of neat. That's what we can use atomic fingerprints for, okay? You can do it in astronomy, okay? So now let's actually push into our electron homes, okay? So our nucleus is gonna be where our electrons can exist. The nucleus isn't gonna be on our image. So our nucleus, oh here, we got a whiteboard, why not? Here's our nucleus, it's underneath all the way down here. That's an awesome pen. Everybody in back can see that that says nucleus, right? It was sarcasm. Jeez. Okay, so our nucleus, nice and low in energy. Oh, you. There's a nucleus at the bottom of that. Here we go. There's our nucleus. Boom. Nice and low, right? Cool. Our energy levels. Okay, there's our first energy level. Ta-da, black line. Okay. I'm now going to move the electrons further and further from the nucleus. Eventually, what happens? What's that? Eventually, there will no longer be an attraction between the nucleus and that electron. Because the electron has gotten too far away. It can't see the nucleus which means the electron is now not attached to the atom. Where would the electron be? It's free. It would be free, not associated with anything, with anything. So there's nothing there. What do we call that nothing? A vacuum. So we can label the maximum that we could possibly ever get to as a vacuum, which I can never spell, so V-A-C. Okay. <laughs> So now, where's our next energy level? Right? We could go through and approximate and say, well, it's roughly the same distance, right? So I, there was our nucleus down there, right? We could say, oh, they're just like this, the exact same all the way across. But if we're looking at a three-dimensional object and we're approximating a sphere, the further out we get, we're not going to get a perfectly linear relationship showing those even spacings, right? And it turns out that it's pretty significant. The spacing between our energy levels drastically decreases as we move further and further up. Okay? And we could, in theory, go up to an infin infinite amount of levels. We don't achieve an infinite amount, because eventually what happens? 
Okay? We're eventually at the vacuum, and it becomes difficult to differentiate that far. Okay? How many levels are there? A lot. Eleven. No and no. Infinite. No. Anybody have a periodic table handy? Four. No. Five. No. Seven. Why did you say seven? Someone said seven. Or did I just make that up? How many rows are there in the periodic table? There are seven rows. Guess what each row references? The energy levels. The bottom two rows, those are inserts into the primary periodic table. Should we pull up the big one? So we can see that real quickly? Or are you guys comfortable? Okay, I heard oh, we're good. Okay. So those bottom two are inserts. We have seven rows. There are seven energy levels. So they're all our energy levels. Okay, I can call those energy levels whatever I want. What do I want to call them? One. Two. Three. To seven, right? Okay. You might be, that's kind of a silly naming system. It's not a bad one. Okay, except for what? What becomes the problem with naming it that way? When I say one, what do you think of? Hydrogen, that's not a bad idea. How many hydrogens do you think of when I say one? One. What is the issue with one? There's a numerical value associated with it. Are these numerical values? No, these are names. Be careful with that. All right? This is not a numerical value. This is a name. The name of that blue one is two. Right, really going, that's kind of silly. Look at your name. It's just as silly. Right? It's completely arbitrary. But that is the name we've associated with it. Okay? These were to describe what? The energy levels for what? Electrons. So our electrons, all of the atoms, all the elements we've got, the electrons for every single one of those elements has to be able to fit into these energy levels. Okay? What happens when I bring an electron near an electron? They repel. Which means, how many electrons should I be able to fit into one? One. Why one? Because they would repel if there was more than one. So how many electrons could I fit into my diagram? Seven, which would explain how many elements? Seven. There's a lot more than seven elements on our periodic table. So the first approximation I'll give you is that each individual orbital can hold more than one. Why? Quantum. Okay. What is that quantum principle? With protons, we could put multiple protons together because we had neutrons to cause them to stick, right? Okay. With electrons, we don't have a new particle, but what we do have is this reference to what's known as a spin state. Okay. And it's easiest to represent it as just an up arrow and a down arrow. Usually they're half-headed arrows. Okay? So I can fit two electrons in there because one is spin up and one is spin down. Because they spin opposite directions, which isn't officially true, but because they spin differently, they're allowed to exist in the same space. Okay? The only reason we have that is that each orbital can now hold two electrons. That's the big part. So how many electrons can I describe? 14. Great. I've doubled my number. Still not even close. Okay. So as we go through and build this, we had to come up with explanations for what's going on behind it. And a lot of this comes back to the mathematics that allowed us to solve these. Okay. So what we've described so far is an energy level and a spin state. Okay. The next thing that we encounter is what I would refer to as a type. Okay? Each energy level gets a particular type of orbital. When I start at the first energy level, there is only one type. Okay? What's an easy way to remember? There's only one type for the first energy level. It's called one. One type. Okay? When I move to the second energy level... 
I get a new type. But I got to copy the previous work. Remember, standing on shoulders, right? So if I copy, for the second energy level, I'm now going to have two types. When I move to the third energy, I'm going to have three types. When I move to the seventh energy, seven lines. Trust me. Okay? Those are now our types of orbitals. Right? Just like we did for our energy levels, we want to name these. Okay? What might be a good name system to use? 3-1. Okay, 3-1. I'm not following. I think I see what you're saying. So you'd be saying the bottom one is 1-1. 2-1, 2-2. Two two. Yeah. Okay? That's not a bad idea. We're now starting to repeat numbers, right? That could be confusing. We could do letters. We could call this 1A. Call it 2A, 2B, right? Then it would be 3A, 3B, 3C. Make sense? Cool. That would be really useful. We didn't do that. Okay. We started with S. We called the first one S. Okay. We'll address a potential mnemonic device for why we call it S in a second. So when we get up to the second energy level, well, we're going to copy what we had before. What kind of orbital type did we have before? S. S. We need a new one. Okay. Because P comes after S. I thought that was actually true for a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Move up to the next energy level, our green. What do I want to label that very first one? 3S. The next one. 3P. 3D. Doesn't have to be rhyme or reason, but you have to know the sequence. What comes after D? F. After F. G. Don't you know your alphabet? After G. H. B is, ah, oh, whatever. Those are your letters. C, P, D, F, G, H. Do we deal with G and H? No. They're actually so high up, we haven't actually been able to get to that energy level or that orbital type. Okay, so cool. This explodes the amount of numbers that we can get in there. Even with two per each, though, still doesn't work. Damn it. So we get a new thing that comes out of this. Okay? This new thing is what I like to call an orientation. As an orientation, it works great for the 130 level. Because our 130 level really just talks about this section. And it's phenomenal for orientation there. Above that, it completely falls apart. Mostly falls apart. Okay, so let's go through and consider this. The orientation implies what? Could you describe my orientation? Mm, that might have been <laughs> an odd question to ask. Um, that, that didn't work out so well. Let's do a physical object other than me. Could you describe the orientation of this? Yes, somebody watching at home might be like, what the hell is he talking about? Why would somebody at home re-watching this video be like, what the hell is he talking about? They can't see it. So an orientation implies what? We're looking at a physical object. Okay. This is a rock. Yes. Uh, and I don't know what rock it is. I'll work on that. Okay. So we need to get an idea of what these orbitals look like before we can look at an orientation. Okay. What word begins with S that describes a shape other than shape? <laughs> Spherical. Or sphere. The S orbital is a sphere, beginning with S. Fantastic. It's nice. We get a correlation there. That makes a lot of sense. Okay? There is one orientation for a sphere, meaning if I take a sphere and I turned it, would you be able to tell that I had turned it? No. Okay? So there's only one orientation for that. How many orientations do you think there are for the 2S? 
You're like two, right? Because it's the second one. What was the shape of the S type? A sphere. Can you tell a sphere was rotated? No. How many orientations are there? There is only one. What is the shape for the P? Anybody speak German in this class? That looks like a hand, so I may not be able to pull this one off. Damn it. Okay. If you know German, if you've done some weightlifting in German, okay, the word for that object that you lift right, in German begins with what letter? It begins with P. What is that object that you lift? Dumbbell. So there's a little place where you hold it, right? And then you got the weights on either end. It's dumbbell. People that are speaking German, they're like, I don't know what language he's speaking, but it ain't German. Okay. P. Okay. Is this dumbbell shape. That's how we refer to it. Which sucks, because dumbbell begins with D, and we have an orbital with the symbol D, and it's not that one. Okay. P is our dumbbell. If I took that dumbbell and I turned it, would you be able to tell I turned it? Yes. Yes. What, how would you describe where that dumbbell is located right now? It's all on the screen. Horizontal is possible. Too much English. These are what the shapes are. The how we moved from one shape to the other, quantum. Okay. And that one you laugh. You're like, oh, you're just being a jagged. No, actually... It is legitimately the quantum physics that describes how an electron exists at those particular energy levels. The shapes fall out of the mathematics if you beat them hard enough with a stick. <laughs> you won't understand the mathematics. I don't understand the mathematics, but that's where those shapes are coming from. Okay? It's, it's a mathematical description of where the electron exists. Okay? So there's not a nice rhyme reason for that. Okay? So still, orientation. Where would you tell me that dumbbell was located? Above the circle. Above the circle. Fair. <laughs> do it again. Keep going. Anybody gone to the gym? You can do like bicep curls, right? What's the other version you could do? Hammers. Hammer. What happened to the orientation? X versus Y, right? This is representing a three-dimensional object, which means... There's also the Z, which there's no way in hell I can draw appropriately. But there's our Z axis. How many different orientations do we get? Three. three. One, two, three. There are three orientations for a P orbital. Okay. So our S gets us one orientation. Our P gets us three orientations. As we scale upwards, we go up to the third energy level. How many orientations do we get for the three S? One. Why? It's a sphere. How many orientations do I get for the P? Three, because it's a dumbbell. One, two, three. How many orientations do I get for the D? You're like, dang, I don't know yet. You get five. One, two, three, four, five. We'll address that Y in a second. As we go up, after D, we'll get 4F. How many orientations do we get for the F? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. Those numbers are going to become important in a little bit. Okay. So, ooh, I don't know. I want to delete all this, but I kind of do. Do I have it pretty? I don't have it pretty, so we're going to run with it as it is. So, these are now where all of my electrons can exist. For any given atom, I can now explain where each of those electrons are. Those horizontal lines that I'm drawing all the way up, those represent an orbital. How many electrons did I say I could put into an orbital? Two. So I can explain now where a lot of electrons can exist. And interestingly enough, I can explain where every single electron on the periodic table exists. Okay? Based off of this. So let's go ahead and use this. I want to know where hydrogen's electrons are located. 
So how many electrons does hydrogen have? One. That one electron has to somehow go into these possible orbitals. Where should I place it? Why the first energy level? Sorry, what was that? Smallest pole. What do we say about energies? The first row is our lowest energy. You're bringing in row, which we'll come back to in a second. Lowest energy. Our lowest energy one was the lowest one on our screen. That's our S. Our 1s. So there's that one electron for hydrogen. Okay? So I could draw this out. How many of you want to draw this? How many people have drawn this? Let's try that. Like three people. Good on you, because I think this is cool. The rest of you probably want a shorthand to describe where that hydrogen electron is located, right? So tell me, where did I place that electron? I put it in the first energy level, in the S type. How many electrons did I place? One. There's a notation. How about helium? What makes helium more difficult? It has two electrons. Where's the first electron go? The exact same place that our hydrogen went. So we would get a copy of our hydrogen, 1s1. Where does our next electron go? So I heard a 2s. How many electrons fit in each orbital? Two. How many do I have so far? One, which means I can still put it there. We're continuing from our hydrogen. That single orbital can hold two electrons. So our helium configuration can now be 1s1. That was our copy from hydrogen. We have to explain the one extra electron that we've got. Where does that one extra electron go? There's still a hole that I can place it in the first energy level. 1s Still representing that one electron. I'm hearing a lot of people say 1s2. Okay, why, why could we say 1s2? What is the point of saying 1s2? For instance, if I go through and say 1s1, 1s2, you are wrong. Where is that 2 coming from? Combining all of our electrons. We're just simplifying our expression. 1s has shown up twice, which means I can say 1s, and I'll add that with that, and I get 1s2. How many electrons could I fit in that? Two. How many electrons did I show? Someone said, wow, thank you. Okay. Lithium. How many electrons does lithium have? Three, All right? So first electron, where does it go? 1s1, where's the next electron go? 1s, where's the next electron go? I have to move up in energy, so I'll go up to the second energy level. The first one I encounter is my s, and I get 2s. Could I simplify that? Yep. 1s2, 2s1. Yeah? Should we curve it a little bit? Discomfort. So that means, yes, we should make it more difficult. Sulfur. How many electrons does sulfur have? For those people that do not have a periodic table handy, that makes it difficult. There are 16 electrons. You've got to explain where all 16 electrons are for sulfur. This is your turn. Try. Find each and every single location for those. If you've got a question, you can raise your hand. I'll come to you. This is your opportunity to actually try this on your own. See? Roughly up on the board. We explained, hopefully, 16 electrons. So if we did this right with your addendums... 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Those superscripts represented all of the electrons. Okay. How many people actually wrote it out that way? No. Okay, so that's an awful, ugly way to do it. So what we might do is try and condense this and simplify. How could we go through and condense and simplify? 
I could call this 1s2. 2s2. 2p6. 3s2. 3p4. Okay. All we're doing is condensing that down so we get a much shorter format. Okay. If we total up 2 and 2 is 4 plus 6. 10 plus 2 plus 4. 16. The superscripts add up nicely for us. Do the letters change? What do you mean? Those were our letters that we made, right? Or is that how they're supposed to be? Is it always going to be 2S or are these the letters that we These are the letters that we will use. This is default chemistry. Right? If you switch to a different language, that might make them change, but I'm pretty sure we hold constant cross languages. Yes? There are three orientations. Why do we have 2P6 if I only have three orientations? Each orientation can hold two electrons, so I have to account for all six. Okay? Yes? So, layers of where questions could come in on an exam. How many of you want to draw the energy diagrams? No, okay, so, no, we don't have to worry about half arrows because you don't have to draw an energy diagram, okay? Do you need to be able to draw an electron configuration? Yes. Okay, and even that, there's some big limitations and pseudo cheats that you could jump in on, okay? Do, a, do I expect you to draw this massively, stupidly long one? No. I, I want this one. I want the shorthand. What I'm trying to show by showing the massively, stupidly long one is that you can see all of those pieces all the way through. The orbit, yeah. Uh, it would be a multiple choice, and there's no way in hell I'm giving you that for a multiple choice. Okay, because I don't want to write that. Okay? So where electron configurations will show up is a multiple choice, not show your work. Okay, because it, it's literally just an answer. Right? And you might be like, well, there's still a lot of thought that had to go into that. No. Right? There's actually very little thought that has to go into it. Right? And that's where things become interesting. So let's... Can I clear everything? Just delete? Yeah, okay. Do a couple deletions here. What did we say hydrogen was? 1s1. What did we say helium was? Which, of course, are weird. Lithium. We didn't ask it. Sodium. You're like, oh, oh that was going to be really hard. Uh, no, actually, it's 3s1. With everything else is filled in. Potassium. 4S1 with everything filled in. What? Oh, because it's assumed. Right? Yeah. The number in front represented what? The energy level first. Once you know the energy level, what did that correspond to on our periodic table? That was the row. That S was the orbital type, right? Guess what those first two columns of your periodic table are known as? The S block. Because their outermost electron is going to fill the S orbital. What does the one represent? The number of electrons on our periodic table? It would be the column, but in particular the column of your block, your orbital block. Okay. I heard a what? Give me a second. We've got to get a periodic table up here eventually. All right. Let's take a look at sulfur. What did we say sulfur was? We did all that work, right? We had 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 
3 S2, 3 P4. If this system that I'm pointing to makes sense, shouldn't it work for sulfur? Which row is sulfur in? Take a look at the periodic table. Which row is sulfur in? Try again. It's in the third row. The blocks. We haven't defined what those blocks are. I'll draw that up in a second. Believe it or not, where sulfur is found is the P block. If you pretend that area where sulfur is is kind of a little square, boxy looking thing, you see that shape? Which column is it in? It's in the fourth one. All of that information is stashed already in the periodic table. This is why our periodic table is insanely cool. Right? The organization structure behind this allows us to draw electron configurations effectively at will, just straight from the periodic table, just by playing a game of Battleship. Okay? Really useful. Okay? So, with our electron homes, we're going to spin through that a little bit. These are effectively just locations. Where does each one exist? It's a house. Okay? Just like your address. Don't share it with me at least. State, city, street, address. What number on the street? All of those are refining information so you get closer and closer to exactly where you live, just like exactly where the electrons live. That's the point of it. When we're looking at our atomic line spectrum, what's happening? It's the electrons getting excited up to a higher energy and dropping down. We had that from our atomic line spectrum, but the number of elements, the sheer volume, didn't explain it right. That's where we had to go back to the mathematics, the quantum mechanics, to deal with that, and that's where the rest of these orbital types, orientations, and spins falls out. Okay? Way above our pay grade. Okay? But that's where they're coming from. What we are trying to do with these is just describe where the orbitals exist. When we look at our types, we had S and P, sphere, Dumbbell. D, what does that look like? Shamrock. Shamrock was nice. Clover, we represent that as a clover leaf. Right? When we look at the sphere, there was only one orientation. I can't change, I can spin that, you can't tell it moved. The dumbbell, I can tell it moved. So I get multiple orientations for that one. That's where we get the X, Y, and Z axes. When we move to the clover leaf, Okay? It's a slightly larger shape, so its shape and its orientations get a lot more complicated, but we get the same kind of process. Okay? We can orient that along the different axes until we get to the fifth one, and we're like, what the hell is that? Okay? <laughs> Orientation isn't perfect. Okay? It's close. It's ultimately how that orbital and the mathematics describe what's going on, which brings up kind of the next issue. When we're looking at our electrons, these shapes are derived from the mathematics of where we could find the electron. It's a probability. So if I take a look at my first energy level with my sphere type, what's happening to generate that shape is I said, well, where could the electron exist? It could exist here. There it is, red dot, that's where it exists. And then I check the math again. Oh, it could actually exist over here and here. So it'll be extra irritating for people at home. They're like, <laughs> and what shape does that start to look like? That starts to look like that spherical shape. Is it perfect? No. 95% of the time, the electrons fall within that shape. 5% of the time, they do whatever the hell they feel like. Okay? But that's the shapes we're seeing. They're probabilities of finding the electrons. So we just went through and said, well, let's find the electron, see what shape comes out of it. That's the shape that we get. These are not orbits. They aren't moving around in circles. Okay? They're jumping from hell and gone all over the place. Okay? Electrons do weird things. Anybody talk, told you weird stuff happening in quantum? It's probably true. Electrons do it. Okay? If I wanted to walk through this wall, you'd be like, that's stupid. You're not going to do it. An electron can do it. It can exist here and on the other side without passing through the wall. What the F? Quantum. Okay. 
That's how it works. All right. So our d orbitals get those different orientations. If we look at orbital capacities, okay, we've kind of addressed this. Each orbital holds two. So for the first energy level, I only get one orbital orient type with one orbital orientation, which means how many electrons can I fit? Two. So for the first energy level, I get two electrons. What happens if I move to the second energy level? How many types do I get? Two. I get a copy of the first one, S, and new. With that new one, I have to consider orientation. Are there multiple orientations for that new one? Yep. How many orientations? Three. You're like, man, it's, it's going to suck having to memorize that. We'll fix that in a second, too. How many electrons fit in the 2S? Two. How many fit in the 2P? Six. How many fit in the second energy level? Eight. Okay. So if you've seen these, and I'm, we'll lay into people doing this stupid crap. If you've seen this stuff, okay, that is elementary school. If someone is teaching you that in college, they need to go back and take a chemistry class. That does not exist. Okay? Biologists, I'm freaking staring at you. Okay? That does not exist. Okay? So we can go through and build these things out. We can look at our orbital homes. Everything's going lowest energy, and we slowly scaffold and build things upwards. Okay? The filling diagram. You might be like, oh, man, I have to memorize that filling pattern, right? 1s, then 2s, then 2p, then 3s. Oh, that's just tedious. So you get this stupid needlework thing, which is great if you can write in straight lines, okay? like grids. If you can't write in grids, this thing is awful because you'll end up going to the exam and being like, cool, it fills 1s, then it does 2s, and then it, then, then, was it 3p? You'd be like, well, it's obvious here. Test your handwriting. One of you has phenomenal handwriting. This would be great for. Most of you did not. Okay? You have to have that solid grid pattern. If you don't have the grid pattern, that's awful, and it doesn't work well because you'd have to memorize it. Okay? Next part. When we go through all of that, do I really care about labeling all of the electrons? No. Which becomes relevant when we move into Lewis structure and bonding. When we first interacted, did you like rip open my chest to see what was going on inside? No, that was a, a horrible interaction. You probably looked at what was on the outside. You didn't like peel back, don't do that. Like, <laughs> okay? Very silence of lamb stuff, right? Okay? You're just looking at the surface level. When we're building molecules, that's where we want to keep our focus first. We want to talk about how these atoms interact. What's the most likely thing? when I bring two atoms near each other to interact? What makes an atom? Protons, neutrons, electrons. What's the most likely thing when I bring two atoms near each other? What's the first thing that's going to contact? Electrons. The electrons. Okay. Which electrons? The one at the lowest energy? The highest energy. Those highest energy electrons are known as our valence electrons. Almost all of our chemical properties can be determined based off of looking at just those electrons. Is it perfect? No. Is it good enough for chem 130, 151, 152, all of like lower level chemistry? Yes, it's phenomenal. Do it. Okay. So our valence electrons are the highest energy level. How would you know it was the highest energy level? <laughs> Farthest from the nucleus. Okay. Does anybody see a nucleus? Okay, so your explanation, pardon the term, sucks. Where are valence electrons? Hmm? 
What highest number? Valence electrons in this case would be? Two. You're like, that's not the last one. That's true. Our valence electrons have to do with our highest energy level. The highest energy level, that's that first number, four. Okay. Why is 4s2 coming before the 3d10? Did you look at the fill pattern? Did you memorize it yet? No? Yeah, it kind of sucks, huh? Okay. 4s comes before the 3d. We'll see that in a second when we see a periodic table here. Right? I still got time. We go to three, right? Some people are like, yeah. Other people are like, what the? I didn't sign up for that. Let's take a look. Periodic table, I said there were blocks. Ta-da, there are blocks. The first two columns, kind of standing out free-floating, are known as the S block. How many electrons could I fit into an S orbital? Two. two. How many columns are there? Two. The information's embedded in the periodic table. The P block. Okay, that's that light color green one. How many orientations are there for the P orbitals? Orientations. Three. Number of electrons. Six. How many columns are there in the P block? Six. Since each orientation holds two electrons, that would be how many orientations? Six divided by two? Three. Okay. Jump to the F block. How many columns in the F block? 14. How many electrons fit in the F block? 14. The columns correspond to the number of electrons in each. How many orientations are there? Seven. Why seven? Each orbital holds two electrons. If there's 14 possible electrons, divide by two, I've got my orientations. <coughs> Neat. Periodic table has it. Okay. We talked about that whole weird thing with, you know, actually, do I need a better periodic table? Of course, I don't have a better periodic table anywhere near in here, do I? Okay, so we're going to have to go up. We talked about looking at, so this will be fun because the recording isn't going to show anything useful except a white screen and a bunch of scribbles. Okay, There's our periodic table. Talked about having to know that fill pattern, right? Okay, And I said 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6. And then what did I do? 4s2, 3d10. Officially, we then move 4p6. What do you think comes next? 5s2. What the heck is going on with this weird ordering, right? That would really suck to have to memorize. You don't. Let's start with our periodic table. This is going to be a little bit hard, but let's see what I can do. Here we go. Hydrogen. Okay. First energy. First row. First energy level. So one. It's the first one in the S block, right? So that would be 1s1. <coughs> Helium, first row, so one, okay? Where is it? Is it in the S block or P block? It's kind of weird. Remember our hydrogen and helium can sometimes float off the periodic table to get a better understanding of what's going on with them? It is 1s2. So what you could do is just memorize hydrogen and helium's electron configurations. The rest will follow a nice pattern. What I mean by rest, let's take a look at Lithium is in which row? Two. Two. Which column? One. Which block? S. So we get 2S1. Beryllium? It's going to look awesome. Keep looking at the other side. Boron. Second row. Which block is it? It's now in the P block. Which column of the P block? 2P1. How about oxygen? 2p4, neon, 2p6, what happens next? 
I'd move to the sodium, right? 3S1, and we move through, right? What do we move to after 3S? 3P, then what comes after argon? Potassium, where's potassium located? Fourth row, which block? 4S. I don't have to memorize the pattern. The periodic table is literally organized as long as I know how to read it to translate directly across. Now the trick that I do have to watch out for. Because I go to calcium and I would be 4S2. What happens when I move to scandium? That's in the fourth row, right? So wouldn't we say 4? No, unfortunately our D block is offset by 1. I have to memorize that offset. That now starts 3D all the way up to zinc. When I move over to gallium, what happens? I'm now back to our standard block and we're our fourth energy. First one in the P block, 4P1. Cool? We finish that out and what do we hit after krypton? We go to rubidium, which is 5S1, right? Make sense? Our patterns are there and established for us to move through. Okay? With that content, believe it or not, you have the ability to do the Lewis Structure video. All of it. It is an hour long. You should start it sooner. Right?